Okay. Hello, Ken Dinsky. How are you doing? It's all right. You're, you're allowed to say yes. It's fine. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm Dylan Beatty, and uh, they've invited me to come here today to talk to you about architecture, the stuff that is hard to change. Now, I have to be clear, the architecture on this slide here, this is Lego architecture. This is easy to change. We're talking about something different today. Uh, this is me. My name is Dylan Beatty. Twitter is the best place to find me if you want to talk about software, technology, architecture, any of this kind of stuff. I'm the CTO at Skills Matter in London. We run a whole bunch of conferences, training, all those kinds of things. I'm a Microsoft MVP. Thank you, Microsoft. Uh, I run the London.NET user group. I also invented a programming language for a joke, which now has 5,000 stars on GitHub, which you will hear more tonight if you stick around for the party. It's called Rockstar. The idea is everybody can be a Rockstar developer. Then we can go and get all those, those sweet LinkedIn jobs that they have. And around about six, seven years ago, I got promoted in my job. And I got an email from my boss that said, Dear Dylan, this is to confirm your change of job role to systems architect. Effective immediately. I thought, oh, promotion? Very nice. You are now responsible for architecture, architecting, doing architect stuff, systems architecture, and architecting systems. Congratulations on your new role. And I went back to my desk, and I sat down, and I went, all right, architect. This feels a lot like being a developer. I don't have any superpowers. And I thought, I'm an architect now. I should probably find out what one of those is. So I started digging. You know, I, I've always been, I've been a professional developer my entire life. And you hear all these, these words that come up about you know, architectures and pipelines and all this kind of stuff. But actually in software, we are really bad at stealing words from other places. You, know, you, you listen to a software dev team in a given day, and they'll use words like crash and pipeline and bus. And well, bus crash, that sounds bad, right? You know? And we're like, no, 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 not that kind of bus. And we're like, oh yeah, mouse, python, and someone's thinking, are you running a zoo? You know, We steal all these words from everywhere else, and we use them to mean what we want them to mean. And one of the words that we have borrowed, stolen, liberated, whatever, is this word architect. And to understand architecture, I think we need to dig a little deeper. We need to look at the origin of the phrase engineer and how that applies to building software systems. Because there is this controversy going on in the world right now about whether developers, people who write code, can call themselves engineers. And you know, it's one of these, you see recruitment adverts and people talk, oh, we were hiring 100 uh, PHP engineers, Java engineers, CQRS engineers, DevOps engineers, whatever. Um, but actually, in different places around the world, there are laws about what you can do. In Canada, you cannot call yourself an engineer unless you have a government license and you're a member of the Institute of Engineers. In New Zealand, if you have a university degree which has engineer in the title. So if you did software engineering, you're an engineer. If you did computer science, you're not. You're a scientist. I had a guy, a cable in my house went out the other week, and the cable company sent an engineer to come and fix it. And this guy turns up in a van with a drill this long, and I'm like, I don't think you have an engineering qualification. I think they just sent you out with a drill to fix the cable, you know. Um, so where did this whole idea of engineering and architecture come from? Well, we get them from, from construction. You know, and the distinction, I think, if you look at, at, at these two fine examples of building engineering, I think the thing on the left, the person who designed it probably built it, maybe by themselves. And I think that the, the Brooklyn Bridge here, I think the person who designed that probably didn't build it by themselves. So maybe that's an angle we can work with. Like, what, what if architecture is the point where you are designing something that is big enough that you are not going to be involved directly in building it, in creating it, and that kind of idea? Now, you know, we've got all these amazing accomplishments. Building architecture is a celebrated discipline that's thousands of years old. Um, but we don't get architects anywhere else. There's no racing car architects. There's no airplane architects. We've got building architecture, and we've got software architecture. And the first person to use the term engineering as applied to software was this person. Anyone know who this is? Margaret Hamilton. She was the project lead on the software that got Apollo to the moon 50 years ago this year. Um, also, I think one of the rooms at Kandinsky is, is named after her. There's a Hamilton room here. Um, 
And she was the first person to talk about software engineering and something she called a systems view. The software is not something, we don't build the system and then run software on top of it. The software is part of how the entire system operates. It's like the guidance system or the hydraulic system or the electrical system. To build the software effectively and to get it to work, you need to understand what you can expect from all of the other components that make up the idea of this, this working system. And for most of the first few decades of the IT industry, architecture invariably referred to physical machinery. It referred to the physical design of computer systems. The term computer architecture goes back to this guy, Fred Brooks. He wrote The Mythical Man Month. You've probably heard of him. Um, and in 1962, he wrote a paper about designing an operating system and a, a new software, a new computer platform for IBM. And he came up with this definition. Computer architecture, like other architecture, is the art of determining the needs of the user of a structure and then designing to meet those needs as effectively as possible within economic and technological constraints. Now, this caught on in a big way, this idea of computer architectures. And we still talk about the x64 architecture and the RISC architecture and the ARM architecture. Uh, but, you know, there's this whole idea up until then, this was a good example of architecture being stuff that is hard to change, stuff that is expensive to change. If you changed your mind about the design of the processor in a mini computer in the 1970s, you had to basically rebuild your factories and talk to your suppliers, get different components, change the production line, change every single detail of that system. The architecture was the stuff that was really expensive. Software, no. Nah. You make a mistake in the software, you're talking about a fraction of a percent relative to the cost of making a change in the hardware. And so architecture was the stuff that was hard to change. Everything else was easy. You just backspace and change the code and ship a new release, right? And then a couple of things changed. Because until the sort of you know, early 1990s, most computer software ran on machines like this. It sat in your office in the corner, and you did spreadsheets, and you printed them out, put them in your report, and that was all that happened. And almost all computing was done using just off-the-shelf software, you know, WordStar, Quattro Pro, MS-DOS, just software you'd go out and buy, and it cost a bit of money to buy it, but your business didn't really think about it too hard. Two things happened in the 1990s that made us really start reconsidering a lot of these ideas. One of them was Visual Basic. And the reason why I think Visual Basic is important is because suddenly it was feasible for small companies to have their own software. You'd have like a, a shop on your high street that sold flowers, and they'd hire the neighbor's kid to come in and make them a stock control system for their florist. And suddenly, they're a bespoke software house, you know? Three people have been selling flowers out of a shop for 20 years, and suddenly they're in the IT business. Hotels, you know, uh, car washes, all these kinds of places were suddenly like, we can build our own systems. And lots of people got, you know, very rich selling these little bespoke Visual Basic applications. And for those businesses, suddenly, you know, they, they change their mind. They'd be like, oh, we want to inventory our flowers a little differently. What do you mean it costs $5,000 to change the software? And so a lot of people who'd never considered it started considering the cost of changes to a software system. And then the other thing, of course, that happened is the World Wide Web came along. And one, suddenly we were building distributed systems at a scale we'd never thought about before. There were very few systems before the web which had more than a few hundred concurrent users. With the web, suddenly you could have a million people on your website at the same time. It's a whole new way of thinking about it, but it also created new kinds of businesses because the web created a way that you could deliver value without ever having to turn it into anything physical. Your Visual Basic app in your flower shop, well, you still sold flowers. That was the business transaction. You sold tires, you sold movie tickets, you sold airplane tickets. But with the web, suddenly it's like, well, we can sell you data. We can sell you services. We can sell you search. We can sell you advertising. And so businesses started to spring up where software was their only asset. They didn't have any stock. They didn't have any inventory. They just had code, and code made money. And the entire business model was, how much money can we make and what does it cost to maintain that code? And so for those businesses, the code was the stuff that's hard to change. And the decisions they made about designing that code could have massive impacts on how successful they were. Now, the specific term software architecture 
dates to the 1990s, to this book, Mary Shaw and David Garland. And what this book kind of set out to do was talk to people who were trying to do this. And we didn't really have a name for it yet. And so they went out and, and they called this book was a, an attempt to formalize a substantial folklore of system design with little consistency or precision, you know. There's this, all these people talking about stuff and telling anecdotes and war stories, and oh, we tried doing this using SMTP as a message relay, and they check it out, and you know, they wanted to try and formalize some of the thinking around it. So let's go back to Fred Brooks' definition and use that as a starting point for, for the next phase of this. So we've got these three characteristics. Architecture, determining the needs of the user, designing to meet those needs, within economic and technological constraints. Now, when you make that transition from being a developer to being an architect, one of the first things I had to get my head around, who are my users? Because I was used to building software that people used, right? User interfaces and web pages and email systems, where real people doing real jobs were on the other end of the thing. So who were my users? Now, Architecture is not about end users. Architecture is about the people who serve those end users. When an architect designs a shopping mall, they are not designing it for shoppers. They are designing it for shopkeepers. The shopkeepers are going to decide where to put the checkout and where to put the stock and where to put the fresh cut flowers and stuff. The architect's job is to build something that they can lease to those shopkeepers. And when you're an architect, your users are developers. They're the people going to be writing the code. They are the people who are affected by the decisions that you make. And it's not just the people you've already got. It's the people you're going to hire two, three, five years from now. People you've never met using software you haven't seen, tools you haven't seen before, to build products you haven't thought of, to sell to customers you don't have yet. And you've got to keep these people happy, by the way. Sounds easy, right? We're going to need a plan. And the problem with plans is that the whole software industry doesn't like plans very much, do we? Because we've all been burned by a three-ring binder that supposedly tells us everything that's going to happen. Um, it's not many people know this, but uh, Rene Descartes, the famous mathematician and philosopher, also did a little agile consultancy on the side. Um, and he was in talking with a client one day, and you know, having this problem, and he said, you know, the Agile Manifesto actually suggests that we should respond to change instead of, we should choose that over following a plan. And the client says, oh, brilliant, we don't have a plan. And Descartes says, but if you don't have a plan, how can you choose not to follow it? Responding to change over following a plan, while there is value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. The Manifesto for Agile Software Development was a bunch of ideas that were distilled from watching successful projects happen and looking at common things that happened there. Now, planning is absolutely essential. The point they're trying to make here, just because you have a plan doesn't mean it's necessarily right. You are going to encounter things you didn't anticipate. Technology is going to bite you. Competitors are going to do unexpected things. The law will change. The system won't work. You need to be flexible. Agile in the English sense of the word, able to respond to those kinds of changes and those kinds of inputs. But that doesn't mean you can just not have a plan at all. You need a plan. You need some idea. If nothing goes wrong, where are you going to be a year from now? What's your best case scenario? What's your worst case scenario? Do you have something to fall back on when these things sort of start happening? There is a principle behind the Agile Manifesto, which kind of locks into this. The best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. Now, a lot of people also say, well, we don't need an architect because the team will just self-organize. And if this starts to happen, you step back and you let it happen because the last thing you want is a team of brilliant people who have really gelled and clicked and they're working together and you coming and going, that's not what it says in the plan. You know, let, let that thing happen. Let that behavior emerge. But that doesn't mean it's guaranteed. Your team comes to you and says, we're stuck. You know, we, we need, and you say to them, oh, well, go and self-organize until the architecture emerges. And then you come back a week later, you're like, where's the architecture? They're like, uh, nothing's emerged, boss. We've been in the bar. And you're like, okay, self-organizing is maybe not the best idea. You know, a, a lot of the ideas in, in software and in, in agile are these are positive behaviors that if you see them happening, allow them to happen. They are not guarantees that a certain set of conditions is definitely going to result in a certain outcome. I think that that's really important. Um, now, we talked a little bit about this idea of 
constraints, designing within constraints. So, so here are the rules of our software engineering department. No new hires, no JavaScript, no open source, no Microsoft, no cookies, by order of the management. You know, this, these are the rules. You can't break the rules here. Who wants to go work here? I'm pretty sure this is actually how Oracle works, but <laughs> <coughs> as an architect, there are constraints which just get imposed by somebody. Oh, we don't use JavaScript here. And you're like, well, actually, I'm going to go and work somewhere where I can use my powers for good, if that's all right with you. But there will be real constraints, things that are just hard. Boss comes to you like, I've got this brilliant idea. We're going to crack SSL and sell credit card numbers. And you're like, yeah, no. Physics would like a word. We cannot. That's not possible. But maybe it is. What about quantum? What about Shaw's algorithm? You know, maybe that might be a business model in the next few years. One of your roles as the architect on a team is to kind of pay attention to the landscape, see what's going on with these constraints. Things that used to be impossible, maybe now is the time to revisit them. The iPhone, first iPhone, came out in 2007. And everybody believed that a touchscreen phone was impossible because all anyone had ever used was the touchscreens on the ticket machines at the railway station. And nobody wanted that in their pocket because it's horrible. And nobody thought that you could do a phone without a keyboard. And there were all these technologies. And Apple had teams of people who were just watching the landscape. And they're like, when is the time? Multi-touch, OK, it's a gimmick, it's a gimmick, it's a gimmick. Right, today, this week, this month, this is the point we think multi-touch is good enough that we can invest and we can be first to market with it. And this kind of innovation, you know, part of your role as an architect is to be aware of constraints. Part of it is to be aware when those constraints maybe are not a factor anymore. Maybe now's your chance to, to innovate and jump on some. Part of your role as an architect is going to be enforcing constraints, disappointing your team. They all go to a conference like this one. They come back on Monday. They're like, hey, we've seen this amazing thing. And you're the person who has to say, I'm sorry. We are still supporting Internet Explorer because it's our biggest client. That's a constraint. It's a commercial constraint, but it's real. It's a factor that influences how you design software. So there we go. Determining user needs. We got a design stuff that's going to keep hypothetical future developers happy on systems we haven't understood yet. We have to meet those needs, and then we have this complex web of technological and uh, you know, corporate and commercial constraints around it. So I'm going to show you the three easy steps for doing the role of architecture on a software project. And it's, it's just like this. You make decisions, you communicate your decisions, and then you reinforce those decisions. Thank you very much. I'll see you next year. How do you make decisions? Well, making decisions is hard. You gather all the information you can, and then you just kind of trust your gut. You've got to go with something. So I want to talk about how do you gather the information that means your gut instinct is probably going to be right. First of all, what have you got? You need to understand the technology that already exists within the company, within the system, within that, the, the ecosystem you're working in. Now, the best way I have found to analyze software systems and understand their capabilities is to look at the borders, the boundaries between the different components. I don't care what the code is doing. I care about the traffic. Software is not screenshots. Software is data flow. Software is living, breathing information flowing between systems. And when you understand how it flows, that gives you a better insight into how those systems work than knowing what the classes are called or looking at the UML diagram. Now, let's take this, probably the simplest software architecture in use on any real system. We got a website that uses HTTP to talk to the internet. I look at that as an architect. I'm like, OK, HTTP, HTTPS, is this encrypted? Which verbs do you support? Get, put, post, delete, patch. Is patch supported here? What are your caching headers? What's the throughput? If I hit that thing too hard, What's going to happen? Will I get rate limit exceeded, or will I get 500 internal server error? You could ask hundreds of questions about that. And you don't care what the website is. Ruby, PHP, Haskell, doesn't matter. And the internet, anything goes. That's way out of our control. But this boundary layer here, there are interesting questions. And when you understand those questions, you're like, OK, I don't know what this website is, but I know it can cope with 10,000 requests per second. And after that, I start getting 500.100 internal server error. That's useful information.
I know that we can't cache anything because it's using session state and it's using sticky sessions. These are useful things to know. You want to kind of approach it like a, you know, Gene Kranz. You remember the movie Apollo 13? Is the guy played by Ed Harris? He was the mission controller on that mission. There's this great quote, I don't care what anything was designed to do, I care about what it can do. Understand the capabilities of the systems. Because you may be surprised. You may go into a company and they're like, oh, we have a high performance authentication system. You're like, it's not high performance. I tried to log in in two separate browser windows at the same time and I took the website down. But then they might also go, oh, we don't have a queuing system. It's like, yeah, you do, you got Redis. I saw it, it's there, it's on your Amazon bill. You know, let's go and look, you've got a full Redis cluster running here already. It's in, it's supported, it's backed up, we can work with that. Understand the capabilities, what these things can do. Now, sometimes people will be like, well, that's all right, I'm working on a greenfield project. Ta-da! I don't have any existing, no, 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 no. There is no such thing as a greenfield project. There will always be things that you can use. There will be some data in an Excel spreadsheet with some formulae, which is actually the best source of truth about the business process you are trying to model here. Some of that stuff will be off limits. You will not be allowed to touch it. There will be politics, because the last time they tried to do it, they blamed the whole thing on MSMQ, and so now no one's ever gonna touch it again. Now, maybe they didn't know what they were doing, but you gotta be aware where, the, where are the unexploded bombs? What are the things you gotta watch out for? There will be the rabbit hole that your entire team will disappear down for four weeks and come out going, we thought we could deserialize XML in JavaScript, but actually it doesn't work, and we've tried 15 different libraries, and they're all broken. And somewhere, there will always be the wreckage of the last attempt to build the system, where someone tried to solve the problem and failed. You know, this is what green fields really look like in software development. They do not exist. What do you need? You've got to be able to ask the right questions, conversations with stakeholders. Everyone will come to you and go, we need a system that's got to be fast and it's got to be secure. You need to be able to dig into words like fast and secure and be like, what do you actually want? Fast, okay, let's talk about fast. How about page load time? Here are some statistics. If we can get the average page back within 1,200 milliseconds, 90% of our users will perceive that as being fast. But one in 10 of our users is gonna have to wait eight seconds because we've got this problem. Is that acceptable? And they say, no, that's unacceptable. And you say, well, maybe we could take some of the JavaScript tracking code off. Maybe we don't need that. And they'd be like, unacceptable. You'd be like, all right, I need to hire another four people to work on this. They'll be like, that's too expensive. You're like, well, you've got to choose. You know, we can cut down on the marketing tracking. We can hire more people. Or we can accept the, the percentile and the deviation in performance. But once you start translating things like make the software fast back into business and investment type decisions, you can have a much more enlightened conversation about where you should be focusing your team and their efforts. We want it to be secure against who? Mossad? Uh -uh. They're already in, they don't care. You don't want to get hacked by Mossad, just don't piss them off. What about your user's angry ex-husband or ex-wife who's in their house with their cell phone and their computer, how are you gonna secure it against them? Is that a threat profile you're worried about? Or are you just worried about botnets that are gonna bang on the door with a list of passwords they downloaded on the pirate bay and if they can't get in within 10 seconds, they're gonna move on to something else. You can't talk about security unless you understand threat profiles and to do that, you have to know how to have these kinds of conversations. What can you build? We build stuff, we're developers, we create new things. As an architect, you need to understand the potential that your team has. And this is about four Ps. People, patterns, packages, process. Who have you got? What are they good at? What are their skills? What are the things they're good at they're not currently doing? Have you got a team of Java devs who all go to Scala meetups in their spare time? Maybe there's an opportunity there to exploit something. You know, What are people interested in learning? What are the risks that you're gonna lose people? What's easy to recruit for? You know, where are you in the world? What are the top popular skill sets? The boot camps in the area where you have your offices? What kind of people are they putting out? Because if you build a project in Elm or Elixir and then you go to, uh, I don't know, somewhere like London and say we're hiring 100 Elm developers, you're not gonna find any because there aren't that many and the ones who are are not based in London. You need to understand these kinds of patterns. Patterns are the kind of schematic, conceptual building blocks of modern software. Some teams, some applications, some frameworks and ecosystems work very well with certain kinds of patterns. The best example I've ever seen of this is the way the Ruby on Rails philosophy is basically the model view controller pattern. If you use Ruby on Rails and you're not doing MVC, you are gonna have a bad time 
because that's what they want you to do. If that pattern doesn't work for you, look for technology which supports the patterns that solve your problem. Packages is about the stuff you don't have to rebuild. The wheels you're not going to have to reinvent. You need to do JPEG compression, find a package that does it. If you're working in a language where you can't even get a JPEG compression library for that language, maybe revisit your choice of language or platform. You know? And process is about how reliably you can go around that cycle. What are we going to do? Have we done it? Review, retro, what's next? Bring that up. If your team is consistently going, we'll do this by Friday afternoon, Friday afternoon, we're done, what's next? Monday, another week, bite that off. You can be confident in your ability to deliver. If your team is constantly going, hey, we've run out of work, and then the next week they're like, nope, still JavaScript, we're going to be stuck on this for three months, you're less confident about your ability to reliably deliver. What can you buy? I used to have a golden rule Never use PowerShell when you can use MasterCard. Your teams should be building things you can sell. If you can't sell it, buy it. Focus on the stuff which is valuable, the, the value you're delivering, the platforms and systems you are creating that other people will pay you for. Don't build your own cloud platform. Amazon are better th at that than you. AWS is better than that than you. Google is, Microsoft is, Alibaba is. Don't build your own crypto library, ever. Please, just don't do it. Smarter people than you have already done this. You, know? you should be focusing on the stuff that your customers and your users want that they can't get anywhere else because that's what makes you special. It's what makes you sustainable. What can you lose? Raise your hand if you have a system in your organization or your company that sends email. Keep your hand up if you have two systems that send email. Three systems, four, five. I did an audit once, I found 12 systems that sent email. Each of one of these, now the first one, I built. The second one, somebody else built, and I didn't realize they were building it. The third person saw we already had two, and neither of them was quite right, so they copied and pasted it. And the fourth person went, all right, I can see a pattern here of creating new templating engines every time you send an email. I will conform to the standards of the organization. The fifth one was outsourced. Sixth one had to be written in uh, Bash because it had to run on a Linux machine somewhere. And then marketing came to us, and they said, we want to change the look and feel of our emails to the new corporate color scheme. I was like, yeah, that's actually a really difficult problem because we've got 12 different decoupled email systems, different languages, different deployment patterns, different templating engines. We wanted to go from white to purple, and now that was a software architecture problem. You know, <laughs> Look for opportunities to deduplicate, to rationalize. Now, premature deduplication, there's this whole thing of, I need to send an email. I know, I'm going to build a completely generic, flexible email relaying transmitting system. Don't do that. The rule of thumb I have here, wait till you've got three of them. When you have three, you've identified three real-world use cases, and then go, right, we have three real systems that are being used. How much overlap is there? How much of this can we rationalize? If you wait longer than that, the work of rationalizing them becomes too difficult. If you do it before that, you're going to be building in flexibility you're probably not going to need. Once you've done all of that, been through those steps, you just got to make a call on what do you think you're going to do. And this is the thing that, you know, people who do this job well and enjoy doing it, a solution just kind of presents itself. Making decisions is hard. Some people are better at it than others. This, I'm afraid, is the part. It's the easy part because you just look at it and you're like, I think we should do that. It's the hard part because if you're wrong, you're not going to find out for five years. Architecture isn't like unit testing. You can't go red, green, refactor. Well, you can go red, green, refactor. But red here is the company is losing money and we can't hire engineers. Green is you're in profit. And refactor is you have to get acquired and change everything and move this and migrate the whole platform. You don't get the rapid feedback loops that you're used to as developers. So you make a decision about how a system is going to be built, how it's going to behave. Then you have to communicate that decision. Now, this is where it gets really hard. Because in your head, you have this, this amazing beautiful, perfect crystal model of software and message buses and event sources and everything is fantastic. And you go, right, I'm going to share the architecture with the team and you give them something that looks like this. And the team look at it and like, is, 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 is that the message bus? But what happens here? Um, the problem with diagrams, we rely on diagrams in software 
because we don't really have a better way of trying to communicate what's in our head with the other people on a team. Now, human beings are really, really good with drawings and diagrams. It's the earliest thing most of us learn to do in school, is to draw pictures. We're surrounded by picture books. We learn to read from picture books. We go to art galleries. Art and drawings and diagrams are all around us. And in construction engineering, where we steal all our words from, we have diagrams that show you different aspects of a system, like the, the basement plan elevation, and we have the south elevation, and then we have the, the perspective artist's rendering view, and then you know, we have the nice sort of marker impressionist sketch. And we can look at these kind of diagrams, and we can look at the finished system, and we can go, all right, yeah, that's exactly what I expected. Now, with software diagrams, we can't do that. Here's a software diagram. Who wants to build me one of these? Now this is written using a formal, standardized, published notation. Can anyone read the language that this diagram is written in? Does anyone even know what, the, what notation this is? Yeah, the problem is we have these languages, but we don't learn to speak them. They teach us in university, if you're lucky enough, and you pass the exam, then you forget about it. This is Jordan DiMarco notation. Now, at the very least, if you've got a diagram like this, put a key on it that explains what system you're using and what the shapes mean. So we've got a database or a file system, because hey, they're the same, right, in software. And we've got a function, and we've got data flows, we've got input output. And you're sort of looking at this and you're like, well, I, I don't know what Excelsior is, and I don't know what Mercutio and Norman are. Uh, this thing, JK, that's a, well, that's a double backslash. Maybe that's a, a Samba share, or like a Windows share. Um, Mandrill, I think I know. Mandrill might be that SMTP service that comes with MailChimp. So with that bit of context, you can start filling in a couple of gaps. So let's start annotating this. Forget what they show you in the textbooks. Let's start putting useful information on OK, so we've put quotes around the code names. So you're not expected to recognize these. Excelsior was a real system I worked on. I said, why did you call it Excelsior? They said, because it imported from Excel. I'm like, all right, brilliant. <laughs> Useless, but naming things is hard. All right, you know, try and establish this ubiquitous language. Once you say to people, yeah, Excelsior has a problem, they're going to know where to look. Mercutio is a .NET service that populates email templates. I never found out why it was called Mercutio. Um, Norman sends emails because Norman Mailer, the famous, yeah. Um, and then this thing over here, these are all real systems, real examples. Um, this thing over here was a, the M there was the marketing drive share, and this was the Dell asset tag of the physical server that originally hosted that department's file share. Mandrill is the MailChimp SMTP relay service. So you start, okay, so we've got a, a SQL server here, we got two .NET services, we got an app, we got this, you know. But <clears throat> we're constrained before you've even started because we've chosen Jordan DeMarco, which means we can only invent four kinds of things. We can only have databases or file systems, functions, data flows, input, output. Nah, scrap it, this doesn't help. No one knows how to read it anyway. The fact that it's in a textbook doesn't make it useful. Let's take our diagram, and I'm going to go and I'm going to get some clip art out of Microsoft Office, and I'm going to start using that. And then I'm going to start color coding it, because we can do that now, because we've all got high definition color displays in our pockets and on our desks all the time. We don't need to photocopy this stuff anymore. And I'm going to include a key to show you what all this kind of stuff means. And now you're probably looking at that and thinking, all right, I'm starting to understand what we've got, so this thing, okay, so that's ADO.net, the green thing here, and, and this is a Samba file share. Yep, I was right, cool. Um, and this little red, the, the red boxes here, I nicked this from RabbitMQ's documentation. It's a message queue, fine, okay, this is SMTP. And then we're gonna go even further, and we're gonna start annotating these boundaries and these network connections. Now let's compare that to the original one. If I hired you to build me a system, which one of these would you rather work from? I mean, this one looks nice, right? It's elegant, and it's sparse, and it photocopies well, which is important in 1977. And you're thinking, wow, the person who drew this must be very smart, because I don't understand, so they're obviously cleverer than me. And this one, you're thinking, well, there's quite a lot of clip art, but OK, so I'm going to need the SMTP credentials. Um, I wonder, do I need, how do I connect to SAS? What's the thing there? Windows authentication required. That could be a problem if Active Directory Federation. This one, you can start thinking about it like an engineer, you know, like somebody who actually solves real problems. Um, 
And the other headache I find all the time in software is the textbooks use trivially small examples which don't really help. This is a real system architecture diagram, and that thing I just showed you is one of these boxes. And I built this, uh, I created this a few years back as part of an outsourcing project we were doing. And they're like, do you have an architecture diagram? I'm like, yeah, they're like, the hell is this? I'm like, that's reality. When you understand that, you're gonna know how to work on the system that we're building here. And this is covered in annotations. They don't conform to any format you'll find in a textbook. You know, this is the legend, we got all these things. There's, there's this thing here, the dark blue means we never worked out what protocol this is. We've looked at it in a network sniffer, we don't have the source code for either end of the pipe and we cannot make sense of it, but it's here. It's in a legacy system, it's still working. Down here, there is this annotation saying, oh, this, this red line means there's a database sync every five minutes, updates usernames and passwords from dynamic CRM, and it may be synced on demand by pressing a big red button. And someone looks at this like, can you show me the big red button? We're like, yeah, come on, internet, bang, there you go. You click that, it'll run this data flow and stuff. And reality is messy. And diagrams are gonna be as messy as reality. It doesn't mean they should be crap. You know, work hard to present information well. But often the information you're presenting is going to be chaotic, unstructured systems that have evolved under multiple teams over a period of decades, you're not gonna make it look elegant because you don't have the elegance to work with. I'll say one final word about diagrams and the whole idea of architectures. These are two systems diagrams. One of these is a thing we call the hexagonal architecture. Which one? It's not the one with the hexagons. Um, this is the ports and adapters pattern where all your business logic is in the middle and it communicates with everything using well-defined interfaces, what we call ports, and then all of your external services and dependencies, you run those through an adapter which translates that behavior to be compatible with the port specification and then you plug in your Windows file share and your database and your RabbitNQ, all the other kind of stuff. Um, this is something I made in PowerPoint using hexagons. And people look at it and they're like, oh, hexagonal architecture. Oh, you have six microservices, very impressive. Never ever be afraid to put your hand up and go, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Like, you know, the, 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 the hexagonal architecture, it just happened the first ports and adapters paper had diagrams with six sides in it. The number six had nothing to do with it. It's just the shape they happened to pick for doing the, the, the diagrams there. And so it became known as the hexagonal architecture. And then people hear the word, but they haven't done the research behind it. And it's hard to sit there in a meeting and go, I'm sorry, I don't actually understand. Can you explain? And you don't need to say you're wrong. You can just you know, gracefully move beyond, okay, just, just refresh my understanding. And someone said, oh, the hexagonal architecture is, is where the, the system has exactly six microservices. And like, well, we only have three microservices, so maybe we could use ports and adapters instead. And you can gently steer the whole thing away from the stormy waters of telling your boss they're an idiot. Um, you've made your decisions, you've drawn your diagrams, you've talked to the team, how do you reinforce them? How do you help the team fall into that pit of success that means they're actually gonna build the thing that you had in your head? And this, to me, falls down to two things. One of them is about validation. One is about verification. Now, validation is, are we building the right thing? Are we solving the correct problem here? Verification, is our solution actually any good? Is the thing we are creating gonna do what we expect it to do? Now, Validating software architecture is hard because there is no short circuit to doing it. You've just got to build it right, ship it, and wait and see. And if in five years' time you're hiring happy developers and all your competitors are out of business, then you probably did okay. And in five years' time you're having to outsource entire chunks of maintenance for millions of dollars a year, maybe not so okay. But verification, is the thing we're building, does that match the architecture? Does that kind of reflect the designs and the decisions that we make? Now in construction, this is easy. You go out to the work site, you hold up your drawing, and you look at the building, and you go, do they look kind of the same? Yeah, that's pretty good. I mean, that, that bit in the middle is maybe not exactly right, but you, know, you can do this very, very easy A-B comparison. Here is the design, here is the reality. How closely do they tally? And you can do the same thing with you know, electrical circuit schematics, you can test circuits, you can test plumbing, you can verify all these things by comparing reality to the diagrams. So here's our software diagram. We're gonna build it, and then we're gonna go and have a look at the system we built and see what it looks like. Uh, so how do, we, how do we look at software? Well, there's this dashboard in Azure that's quite good. Um, they don't really look the same, but, but maybe we're looking in the wrong place. Maybe Team City is a good place to look at what our software is doing. 
Ah, no, no, I tell you, we need to look at the code, no? I got it. Design. This is one view elevation of our system. This is our service dashboard. This is the status of our build pipelines. This is the actual code itself. None of these things is actually going to show us whether the design we have implemented here reflects the decisions that were made. Now, something that I burned out badly on when I first started doing architecture is I thought, I know, I'll review all the code. I'll do all the code reviews. And what I discovered, one, people write code way faster than I can review it. Two, I had other things to do. So I'd get to like 6 o'clock at night. I'd be like, oh, I've got to review 18 pull requests. So I'd just kind of scan over them and stuff. But you know, the most important thing there is it meant the teams were not free to go and innovate in ways that I didn't have the experience to review properly. We had this scenario. I reviewed your C-sharp code, and I still don't know what it does. And the team lead says, dude, my team switched to Haskell two years ago. There is another problem with using code review as a way of enforcing architectural decisions. Let's say we had a nice big architecture meeting with whiteboards and diagrams and everything. And at the end of that meeting, we decide that we are going to use the repository pattern, OK, and identity maps and all these things. And then someone says, hey, I've got some code for you to review. And we go and look at the code. And sure enough, public cast customer repo, identity map of customer, get customer. Yep, OK. And we're looking at that. Now, what can you tell from this code about the design of that software? These are arbitrary labels. It's possible, and I hope, that the person who wrote this code understands the repository pattern, and they understand the identity map, and they are using these labels to help make that code intuitive and maintainable. But it's also possible that they heard these words in the meeting, they don't want to get fired, and so they named their classes after the words from the meeting. If you have ever wandered around an unfamiliar city very late at night after a couple of beers, you may have found yourself checking into a luxury hotel that you know is a luxury hotel, because it says luxury hotel on it in big letters. And then in the morning, you go out to find some breakfast and realize you are staying here. You can't always trust the labels, because labels in software, right click, refactor, bang, you've got an identity map. It's like, I'm pretty sure that was a facade a minute ago, and last week it was a factory pattern. You know, these things are too easy to change. They're too malleable. Even when we have the consensus, you need to be able to dig a little deeper to understand. So how do you guide your teams towards the correct implementation detail? Now, one of them is about aligning people and technology and components. You find the so obvious example, you want your calculation engine in F sharp, you want your front end in JavaScript, Angular. So you put the Angular people together, and you make them build the front end. It sounds really obvious, but there are teams that screw this up. There are organizations that are like, you're the front end team, you're the back end team, and all the JavaScript developers are over there because they've decided that back end is going to be based out of Scotland. And so all the JavaScript developers just happen to be there. That's how they structure it. If you're prepared to push this thing to the extreme, you can actually exploit Conway's law. Uh, Mel Conway had this observation that you're going to end up building software systems whose communication structures reflect the teams that built them. So separate people physically. Tightly coupled components, give them to people who are sat next to each other using the same tech stack. Um, decoupled components, components decoupled in time and space by interfaces and stuff, put them in different countries. I have always wanted to do an experiment where I have a front-end team who speak English and a back-end team who speak Russian and a bilingual architect and see what kind of architecture emerges. Now, maybe that would be you know, not entirely ethical and humane, but I think it would be really interesting to see how software evolved if architecture was the only, you know, basically take Conway's law to a point of having two teams who can't communicate because they share no common language. As the architect, how do you get involved in this? Well, once you've identified your kind of high-level components and your teams, you can start working with them to define the interface they're going to use to communicate. And you can get them up and running straight away. You help them out. You're like, right, you, front-end team, you're going to be talking to an API server. It's going to give you JSON. Spend a couple of days with them. Hash out the JSON. See what's that going to look like. Your back-end team, you're like, someone is going to be sending you requests. You need to respond. I'm going to help you flush out the structure of your tests, and then I'm going to leave you to go and evolve that system. And then when it comes to production time, 
you connect these two pieces together, and that's the bit that you're interested in. You want to watch the traffic. Don't worry too much about the code. These are smart people who will do good work if you point them in the right direction and you know, set them on their way. You want to look at the traffic. Are you seeing the messages you expected? Are you seeing the throughput you expect? A question that often comes up, should architects still code? Hell yeah! But don't put them on production systems that are going to ship to customers because it creates a conflict of interest. You're going to be at that point where it's like, this needs to go live today, but that team is waiting on a design for the new interface they need. Ah, uh, what do I do next? I'm going to do this. And then that team like, right, fine, we don't care. We're not listening to you anymore. And very rapidly, the kind of architectural side of it starts to decompose. But you don't want to get rusty. If you're not actually writing code anymore, you'll get left behind, you'll get grumpy, you'll spend your whole day in meetings. That's no way to a human being to live. The best solution I found to this is the architect build the monitoring and the dashboards. That gives you a way of pairing with the teams on things which are internal facing. You get to build some nice user interface. You get to encourage those conversations with your stakeholders. You get to write real code that runs on real screens and you know, keep the saw sharp, as the, as the expression goes. Um, but trust the teams to build the stuff the customers want. Your job is to build the lenses, the graphs, the reporting. And like I said, you want to pair with them. Hey, you're having problems with your message queue. Let's take a couple of hours or a couple of days, sit down together, get that up on a screen somewhere, and then we get a better idea of, of what we're working with here. One of the other things that architects can do, and I often see that they don't do, is to remind your developers that the decisions that have been taken are not necessarily bad. Now, I was working on a project where we did two things. We switched all of our email to Mandrill and MailChimp, and we switched our customer stuff to Dynamic CRM. Those were the right decisions for the business. Dynamic CRM is a frustrating platform to integrate with, and I'll say that on the record. Um, it has quirks, it has weirdness, it kills your processes if they're not finished in two minutes. No questions asked, and it doesn't tell you what went wrong. So the team who were running that integration were like, why have we chosen this? Because for them, CRM meant all the interesting stuff had been built by Microsoft, and they just had to deal with the pain of the integration. I said to them after a couple of weeks, you remember every Friday we used to have to run these reports so they could send newsletters? And they went, yeah. And I'm like, do you remember how we haven't done that for a couple of months? And I was like, yeah, actually, now you mention it. I'm like, the same people who chose CRM chose MailChimp, and they took that pain away from us. And of course, once the pain's taken away, they don't feel it anymore, they forget about it. And part of your job is to go, look, we did this. We made this decision. It's not all bad. This is the problems we're solving that matter, that are important. You know? And if you're lucky, they'll be like, yeah, actually, that's pretty cool. We'll take the CRM, because those mailing lists were a pain in the ass. And finally, you know, Remember, software architecture is a really young discipline. We got like 50 years from hand coding assembler to where we are now with cloud native and event sourcing and 12 factor applications and uh, you know, running lambdas and, and all these amazing technologies. Construction architecture started with this in 3000 BC and it took them 5000 years for someone to go, hey, what if we made it out of glass? Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> Give us 5,000 years, I guarantee we'll be doing better stuff than, hey, what if we made it out of glass? Thank you very much.